Welcome to Thunder Nerds. I'm Brian Hinton. I'm Sarah Veslov. And I'm Frederick Philip Von Weiss. Thank you so much for consuming the Thunder Nerds, a conversation with the people behind the technology that love what they do and do, and tech, do good. tech good. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for joining again. Appreciate you uh, spending some time with us on a Saturday afternoon. Brian, go ahead and uh, uh, take it off. Yeah, I'd like to thank this season's sponsor, Auth0. Uh, they, they make it super easy for developers to get authentication and authorization set up uh, on whatever app or anything they're building. They are authorization as, and authentication as a service. Uh, you can find out more and try out uh, the service for free at auth0.com. Sarah? Yeah, and if you like what you're seeing today, you can go ahead and go to our YouTube channel. And there's a big red uh, subscribe button right beneath our silly faces. Hit that and uh, you'll know about every show as it comes up and maybe get some access to some bloopers and stuff. Excellent. And with that being said, and without any further ado, we'll go ahead and get to our very special guest. We have speaker, teacher, designer, and developer advocate for the web, Jen Simmons. Welcome to the show, Jen. Hello. How are you? <laughs> well, thanks. How about yourself? Uh, yeah, it's such a weird weird year in a weird weird time um i i i'm sure all of us are quarantined or isolated and confused <laughs> <laughs> to say the least yeah how how has things been in um in the city you're in, in brooklyn right yeah i'm in new york city um and it's really hard uh I've been able to go out more. This is mid-May. May 16th is the day we're recording this. I've been able to go out more um, in May. And it's really upsetting in a weird kind of way. The, just seeing all the stores that are closed and all the signs on the doors saying, we hope we come back. And mm -hmm. the few stores that are still open going in, stores I've shopped in for years and years and finding out who, who works there has, is ill. How ill are they? Are they, are they recovering? Um, it's just, it's really devastating. And the, the um, it, even folks who are, you know, fine are, everyone's just seems just out of it. People are alone and they're walking down the street alone and they're, it's not normal life. And most of the people you see are, are essential workers. They are the, the most vulnerable when it comes to finances and power in society and the ability to stay well and stay away from the virus. And so it's just kind of moving and tragic and worrisome and heartbreaking all at the same time. Um, it just feels like a lot of people, uh, a lot of the people who live in the neighborhood are just like, we're just not in our bodies. You're walking around, you're like out of body, you're covered, covered in a mask, you're sort of stumbling around, um, not just still like, I cannot believe what's happening. I just cannot believe what I'm seeing, um, which is really, really hard. Um, it's, it's, that alone is a kind of a trauma, I think, uh, is, weeks, weeks and weeks of that. Is the vibe of the city uh, still kind of like everyone's holding their breath, but waiting to, you know, come out of it? Or what's the general feel? Yeah, I mean, it's a mix. You know, it's 7 p.m. every night. New York comes out to cheer. Um, so a lot of folks go out. I, mean, I live in a world of brownstones. I, sometimes to describe where I live, I'm like, I live on Sesame Street, like Dr. Hooper's mm -hmm. Street and Susan and Gordon and like <laughs> the buildings look like Sesame Street and the way people interact with each other. Um, so the, the or at least the US version of Sesame Street, I don't know, I haven't seen Sesame Street in a lot of countries, maybe it's different, but the um, you can go out the back door and there's sort of one experience, but if you go out the front door, there's a different experience. And so lots of times you do get to see your neighbors on the street and people are on their own stoops and sort of waving from a distance and cheering and they're there with their families or their kids and because of the distance you don't necessarily need to wear a mask and so it's a bit more like oh hi real life neighbors yeah. like hi hi um, so there are those moments and in some ways you know i've gotten to know the people over the fence more intimately than i ever have before they were the only people I physically saw in real life for two months. And I know their kid better and what they're up to. And I, I, they brought me orange juice and I brought them mulch. And like, it's, you know, it's sort of, it feels like perhaps what happens in a society when really tough times come, something like a war or something like a, a devastating collective event um, where 
that the, the human spirit comes through and people figure out how to thrive in, in the new reality of like, oh, I can never leave my house, but there's one person over the fence. So I'll connect to that you. person. It's that Wilson. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because there's so many folds of this, not just being, you know, one, the sickness, two, the social distancing, where we're all kind of not knowing what's going on. You know, we, we need people, people need people, uh, Barbara Streisand, <laughs> but you know, people do need people. Uh, but, and then there's also the, the financial uh, <coughs> element to this where people are losing their jobs and uh, people can't feed themselves or their families. And it's all these things together. It's, it's, yeah, it's horrible. Yeah, and, and it's unknown. The future is so deeply unknown. It's not like this happened in one morning on a September day and it's over. It's like this has, this is over and over every single day. It's still going on. And even though people, you know, some of the politicians are like, open, it's over, we're sick. It's just like, it's, it's not, and we all know it. And I think a lot of people feel that very viscerally and it makes, it makes, it actually makes it, it things more stressful because then then you just it's just so much fear and uncertainty and doubt and there's no leadership and it's it's hard to be collective and pull together and sort of root for the team and 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 realize that oh my sacrifice and not going out is helping my neighbors if the collective you know if the the leadership is is sort of sowing so many seeds of doubt and kind of pitting everybody against each other it makes it much emotionally much harder. So yeah, I mean, we don't get we, we don't really get political, but like I th I think no matter what side of the aisle you're on, it's pretty obvious that this isn't being handled well. Um, and Not in the United States, no. No, exactly. I mean, there's countries like India that's handling it very well. You don't hear about. There's countries like Taiwan that's handling it very well that you don't hear about. I think you know they have some things where like the government calls their house twice a day to make sure they're home, but. The, they're at a far better place than us. I think New Zealand, they're doing well. Uh, Every country in the world is doing better than us, I think. Yeah, it makes you uh, wonder, or not really sarcastically saying that, um, it's pretty clear uh, yeah. what's, what's going on. China did a tremendous job. I mean, I know people critique China. There's all sorts of things. We can also critique the United States government. There's all sorts of things. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, the mayor of Wuhan at the very beginning was covering things up for reasons inexcusably it costs a lot of people their lives, but then China did an incredible job. And now they're helping countries all around the, the world and, and countries that don't have as much money and places that don't have as many resources. China's, they're helping them. They're, they're, they're shining as a global leader and really helping. And the United States has chosen to do a very, very different thing. And, um, and you can just, all you have to do is look at the number of deaths. There's no escaping that. It's, it's a virus, it's science, it's biology. It's, um, you know, I, well, look, we, we fired one of the main guys <laughs> that's like that knows what he's talking about. Like, it's just ridiculous the way it's being handled. Yeah. Over, I, over I, ego, in some well, opinions. I don't know. And money. One, one positive money. thing I'm curious about that you mentioned uh, how, does the, how did the New York cheer thing even start? I'm always curious how those things like get going while everyone like just decides to go and do it. Like, how did they well, know? It, it really started in China. It was China who had Wuhan. It was in Wuhan that people- and Paris saw, did it too, right? Yeah, I yeah. saw a lot of videos in Wuhan of people exercising in their windows and cheering each other on and um, music, you know, playing music out their back and in, in, in the areas, urban areas where there's high rise buildings and, you know, people can hear each other's windows. And, and then the same kinds of things happen in Italy and, you know, social media and the internet lets us share those things. Um, uh, but it really did start in Wuhan, and I think people and in the art, you know, how art word of mouth. can, it, well, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's inspiring. Um, how exactly did we end up with the 7 p.m. in New York City? I literally yeah. have no idea. I have no idea. I was far too ill to have really even yeah. understand much of what was going on um, in those months, but... Uh, yeah. Do you mind if we uh, touch on yeah. just briefly, like your your own personal experience? Because you uh, a few months ago, you you believe <laughs> that you you caught it, and you think you, uh, do you still believe that you didn't catch it or you you have it? Um, that's what's so frustrating about the United States is that there's really been no healthcare and no help from medical professionals. Um, so do I know for sure? No. Uh, 
I have had a chance to talk to doctors several times. Um, and I have had doctors say by looking at me on video and listening to me um, describe my experience, say, yeah, you know, that's, that's COVID, um, which is considered a clinical diagnosis. Um, I have not had a blood test that showed positive for sure. I've not had an antibody test that showed positive for sure. Um, the, it, but I mean, and, and let's make it clear too. The reason you probably haven't is it's just not available just for people listening. They should understand right. that it's just not available. Yeah. Right. Or, you know, the United States made a decision to not use the test out of Germany that had been, that's being used worldwide that is known to work effectively. And so a lot of the testing that was, has been created, has been created very quickly. And some of it's been created by, you know, the, the trustworthy labs in the United States who do most of the testing for medical reasons all, have for decades. But some of the testing is, you know, FDA, it's just like, what's going on with FDA approval? What's going on with access to tests? What's going, it's like such as, it's so, so deeply corrupt that it's really hard to know what to believe. And um, I, it's also interesting because I, um, because I work internationally and I was traveling in Europe in January and I was hearing news and so I came home in February and I really spent a lot of time learning because that's the great thing about the web is that we have the ability to learn from other people in other countries if we just take it. And so I was watching a lot of English language, whatever was available in English coming out of Asia, coming out of China, coming out of Singapore, coming out of, like go read the equivalent of the CDC website for the health department for the country of Singapore, which is in English. Um, you know, where the, some of the advice in the United States, especially from, I don't know, local news media, or once the CDC website in the United States was altered to present the reality that the Trump administration wanted it to present. Um, you know, a lot of this, like, it's just the flu, you'll have it for three days, it's a mild case. Like, those are not words that anyone was using in the rest of the world. <laughs> and so as I was, you know, I sort of knew when I was hearing those things in March that that was just not true because that's not what anyone was saying in the countries that had had major outbreaks. Um, and so it was very helpful to look at like the Singapore website who said, it's like pneumonia. It is a, like having a horrible case of pneumonia. I was like, okay, thank you. But then it was so hard because a lot of that information coming out of Asia was like, how do you know if you have symptoms? What should you do if you have symptoms? Oh, if you have symptoms, go to the place where they take care of you. Because in other countries, if you had any symptoms at all, you could immediately go to a place where they would take care of you and help you. And so then there was Common no sense, right? information. <laughs> yeah, there was like no information about how to take care of yourself or how to know when you're so critical you need intensive care unit help and you should call 911 in the US, which is, you know, gets you emergency care. Um, how do you know you need a ventilator? How do you, why, why am I left to self-diagnose? Why do I, there were moments yeah. where I realized I knew more than some of the people in the United States healthcare system early on in March. And I was so, it just made me so frustrated. Um, Did you ever reach a point where you were afraid, like, like truly afraid that you might not? I, didn't, wasn't, I wasn't afraid that I was immediately going to die. I was afraid that I was going to have to call the house, the 911. Yeah. There was, there was more than one day where I was really worried I was I needed to go to the hospital. And I, I, I think it was, I think it was smart that you had that oxygen meter too. Yeah, this thing I recommend. I actually think that it's likely, right? So when I was little, my parents, we had a thermometer. Now they're digital. This is my thermometer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I have a feeling that from now on, you know, if I think about my grandparents, like did my great, great grandparents have thermometers? Probably not. So like where, when in the course of human technology did it become super normal yeah. for you? Oh, I have a kid. I need to buy a thermometer. I need to make sure I can take my kid's temperature so I can monitor their illness at any point. Um, I have a feeling that this oxygen pulse ox meter is now going to be that kind of a tool um, where you, you know, you might know this a little bit from seeing it in hospital TV shows or whatever. This one doesn't, is it hooked up to a monitor? It, just, it has batteries in it, but you just click it and put it on your finger and then let's see what my number is. <laughs> and it's Bluetooth too. It syncs with the app so you can keep like a nice log of everything. There might be Bluetooth ones out there, but I did not get a Bluetooth one. This is not Bluetooth. I don't want to be monitored by some third party company that's selling my data. Um, yeah, so 97, 97 is not great, but 97 is not bad. Um, I'd like to see 99, 100 better, but I haven't seen that much. 
Well, I think I, I've seen some of those online because I started looking at them that they were like as low as 30 bucks, yeah. you know, obviously. And there's ones that are like 400 with Bluetooth. But at least like if you get like a 30 buck one, it will help ease anxiety. I had a friend at work that um, they told me the other day they were at the hospital because her husband had a panic attack because, you know, he thought he couldn't breathe, but he, he was having a panic attack. So mm, yeah. at, at least like something like this, you could monitor where you're at and have a, a better sense of, you know, actually I could look at this and I know I need to go to the hospital. Like exactly. something like that is, is, is really uh, helpful. Yeah, some of the doctors I talked to on video, because I there were several, or there were some phone calls too. They were like, why do you have that? I was like, YouTube. <laughs> One doctor was like, I'm so glad you have it because I can see that you're at 95. You should stay there. If it drops lower, if you see 93, you call an ambulance. Like, So it, it was very helpful to him to not have to guess by sort of looking at how blue my skin might be or not, or how was I breathing at that moment or not. Um, and it gave me some reassurance too, to say, you know, I feel really bad, but my number is still good enough that I'm probably not crashing right now and I'm okay, I should stay. But also just the idea that there's no help whatsoever unless you're crashing and you need ventilation is, I think that's an experience unique to the United States. I don't think that that's um, what other countries are. How yeah. yeah. Speaking of uh, devices too, your um, you you were uh, I saw in your tweet your Fitbit show that you had like a like a hundred and fifty heart rate when you were just taking a shower. Like <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah, you know, I I never really I was never very good at biology, and I didn't I kind of was more of a math person in school, um, computer science, and not chemistry. You know, um, and but I've taken my vital signs so many times in the last three months or two and a half months, like. Because the other one that's a good one to take is a respiratory rate, and a good way to easy yeah. easy way to do that. There's some apps where you can well just you just each time you take a breath you just hit the screen and it times it for you and then it calculates it and tells you what your respiratory rate is, which means how many breaths per minute are you breathing. And for me, normal is around 12. It's faster for little kids. A lot of adults, normal is a little faster than 12. I don't know, 14, 16, something like that. But there were times where most recently I've been, I think the last two weeks I've actually gotten, please, I, it's scary to even say this because you don't know. And it's been a, it's such an up and down experience. And I've other times I thought I was getting better and I thought I was over it and then I was not. Um, but the last two weeks, I feel like maybe I finally have cleared it from my body. And now I'm just trying to recover from having pneumonia for two months. Um, but the, you know, I walking around my neighborhood kind of slowly respiratory rate of 25, 28, 30, 32, which is unbelievably fast. Um, pulse oxygen dropping down to like 89, which is just crap numbers. And the only reason I wasn't worried is because I knew if I sat down and let my everything stabilize and I went back to resting, that that 89 would not stay. That that was my lungs not being able to function as I was moving. Um, and heart rate, yeah, heart rate going up to like 160, just walking, which is not, you know, that's not normal. So it's like, no, did I good. have it? Well, there's some science, right? Like, because also we had the little, I didn't have a, a high fever, but I had intermittent low grade fever, also very different than any flu I've ever had in my whole life. I've never had a fever for 15 minutes before. Like, what is that? Um, but intermittent fever, like I just, and also being isolated and being, um, not being able to get any help or see people or like, it's just so confusing. And so just to have some numbers and be like, I graphed it. There's a number I graphed it. <laughs> it's been really helpful. So those things I recommend to people. One of the things I don't recommend though, is there's some folks who, you know, you have to actually buy a, one of these in order to measure your oxygen levels. And I guess there's some phone apps out there where they claim if you put your finger in front oh, of the finger, camera. camera like, yeah. From what I hear from learning from medical professionals, learning from doctors or nurses or epidemiologists or scientists who talk about these things. And everything I've said is just repeating things I've heard from professionals. I don't even listen to like secondhand information that a reporter might tell you necessarily. I like to hear it straight from professionals um, and more than one, and hopefully they're quoting scientific studies. Uh, that those things, those phone app things are like, no, don't bet your life on some phone app camera <laughs> like get yourself the highest quality one of these that you are able to get a hold of um, and then also monitor other signals and trust your gut um, and play it safe um, yeah it's crazy everything you described um, I was in 
Well, I was in San Francisco twice in January, then I was in Seattle late February, and then the very next week I was in New York mm. at the beginning for DevOps days. And I was not feeling well in Seattle. I was feeling worse in New York. And then by the time I got home, I spent uh, about a week or two in bed, fatigue, low grade fever, up and down, um, just exhausted getting up and going to the bathroom and coming back. Um, but I did recover very quickly here in Florida, um, as in many places, the testing is non-existent. Um, so that wasn't really an option. And then about two weeks after I recovered, my husband got sick um, and his was far worse. His was much closer to what you described. He's a nurse, so he does, he, ha he has an oxygen monitor. And um, so he spent quite a lot of time, but that I think was the weirdest thing, the fever, the way, I mean, literally 10 minutes of a fever and then you're, it, it's gone. Um, and, um, you know, we, we tried calling a couple of times, uh, obviously we were quarantined and weren't going anywhere and, um, we're telling Frederick and, and Brian about it. Like every day I was like, do we, do we go to the hospital? Like, do we not go to the hospital? Like that kind of question. Um, uh, but even now he's still just not a hundred percent, you know, he's still very tired a lot and, and, um, which is not like him. So it's, it's really scary. Yeah, I for a long time I was like, do I really have it? Because the symptoms are yeah. so little. And then I was there was a day about a weekend I was like, oh, I'm I'm sick. Yeah. But then I didn't have the fever, and at that moment, all the news in the U.S. was like fever, 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 fever. I was like, but, 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 yeah. but. And then I finally had like a hundred and one degree fever, and I thought, okay, yeah, yeah, I'm actually sick, and this is it. And and, but it, yeah, it was for like fifteen minutes. Yeah. It felt like an A/B test. Like my immune system was like, I don't know what to do. So let me, I don't, let's try a fever. Nah, yeah. that's, we don't need that. Let's not do that. Yeah. Yeah. It, well, it I hope crazy. you're, sorry, sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I hope you, you know, as you said, you feel like you're recovering and, and this, uh, this passes soon. Yeah. And I just, I mean, I'm glad you're okay, sir. And I'm glad your partner is. Um... Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's just, like you said, it's very frustrating because um, I don't want to assume that I had it, but everything fits and particularly my travel, even with my travel, I couldn't get tested. Even though I was in that high risk group, um, my symptoms just weren't enough for them to think highly that it was because at the time, like you said, it was, um, you know, if you didn't have a fever and, and, and those things, I had a sore throat and just extreme fatigue and then an up and down fever. Um, yeah. And that was pretty much the extent of it for me. I never got a cough. Um, did, it, did it affect your lungs? Did you feel pressure? And... No, I, 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 I never got that. Um, so again, maybe it wasn't. Um, but then within 14 days, my husband was sick and he did have the, the pressure and the difficulty breathing and his oxygen levels were up and down. And, and so who's to say, you know, but that's the frustrating part is I have no idea. And those, you know, and if it was, those numbers aren't counted. Um, right. And I don't know if we can get it again because, you know, right. science, yeah, who cares? Yeah, they don't know if the antibody, if you have the antibodies or not, if it's effective. And yeah, I mean, yeah. I had this a similar thing too. Like uh, you, all, you probably you both probably remember. I was on for like yeah. almost, almost a month. Uh, and fevers are the worst. I, uh, fevers and vomiting. Fevers are like you get hot, sweaty, and you're like, okay, I'm gonna take a shower. You, you, you're fine. Then like 30 minutes later hot sweaty oh god i need to take a shower again <laughs> yeah it's yeah it was really bad and i, I was frustrated because there's no way of uh, finding out and i i wonder if it was that simply because i was exposed to a lot of people at a music uh, festival i went to uh like two weeks before they closed florida down <laughs> i'm glad i went uh because it was the last thing i'm probably going to for a long long time um but uh, getting if, getting sick from it was not fun but I'm, I'm mostly scared about all the uh reported cases now of these uh related possibly related symptoms yeah. in children uh, i have a five-year-old so stuff like this scares the hell out of me yeah i mean i i feel like in the united states a lot of folks have just really i mean maybe it's out of fear or maybe it's out of selfishness just downplayed it downplayed it and they want to like be able to do whatever they want and don't restrict my freedom and or even, you know, apart from those, those ideas, just the idea that like, 
hey, if you're younger than 60, you're fine. And it's just the flu and you'll be sick for four days and then you'll be fine. I just, I just, it's just like, no, this, and I know a lot of people in New York who've had it. I know a lot of different levels and different experiences that people have had, but over and over and over again, even the people who seem to have the most mild cases, it just, it's been weeks and weeks and weeks. It's been really scary and confusing. It's, it's, it's not at all like illnesses that people, other people have, you know, that you, that you've had at another moment in your life. And it does feel like a novel virus. It's a new thing to the body and the human body. It just doesn't know what to do with it. And um, I mean, I've, at one point I really thought that I was better, except I was having an incredibly hard time thinking and making sense, putting words together. And I thought, well, that's just because I, you know, I haven't eaten much in a month. Like I just haven't, I need to build my strength back up. I need to build my nutrition back up. But then it went away very quickly. <laughs> like I realized, oh, no, that was the virus. Like that was a different, and then, you know, a week or two later, they were like, oh, turns out maybe, perhaps we think maybe this goes into the brain. Like maybe, so we don't. I just, yes, yeah. all of this is just to say for anyone watching or listening, like don't get this. <laughs> <laughs> like don't think it's nothing. It's not nothing. It's not nothing. It's like the worst. It's like horrible, horrible, horrible case of mono crossed with pneumonia, crossed with being scared. It's super interesting. Crossed with scared. Perfect. <laughs> I don't That's recommend it. And being isolated, like yeah, like yeah. like 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 being alone, <laughs> being on Survivor on the island while you're by yourself. <laughs> <laughs> With all the stress of whether or not you're going to make it with having pneumonia or mono, both. <laughs> but um, not, not to downplay the significance of this conversation, but uh, let's get to some more positive stuff. Uh, yes, we have a bunch of yeah, questions. Yeah, let's talk some web. And, yeah, let's we have a bunch of internet. questions in live chat for you. Uh, ah, live chat. Yeah. Yeah, yeah go for it, Brian. The, yeah, the first one, uh, I'm going to just say your first name, assuming I, I say it correctly, Amir. Uh, he asked uh, about that he's not created many layouts with CSS. And how can I be sure that I'm writing standard and write CSS code is the first part of the question. Uh, then the second part is, is, is there any good project structure and good CSS code that I can take a look at? Like, as I guess is reference. That's a very interesting question. It's, I, I'm, I'm, I'm interpreting it as, you know, what's the right way to do layout now? How do you know whether or not you're doing it right? Where's a good place to go find out what's the right way to do it? Is that, that's sort of the question? Um, yeah. And that kind of reminds me of the way that layout was done for the whole web before 2017, right? So, so <laughs> 1993 to 2017, it was like, oh, how in, how in the world do we get to, how do, how do we put things where we want them to be on the page? Oh, well, here's a technique. Here's a technique. Oh, here's the holy grail technique. Here's a technique using um, HTML tables. Here's a better technique using CSS. Here's a technique, here's a technique, here's a technique. And I guess we really did teach each other sort of, here's the best practice, here's the best hack, here's the best one way to do that thing that everybody wants to do, that one pattern that we all keep wanting to do. And I guess I feel like at this point, the answer is we are hack free. There's not one way. And I would say if you're using CSS, you're using accessible HTML, semantic HTML, you use CSS grid and Flexbox and Multicom and some floats when that's appropriate. And you kind of get to know these tools more and more, get to know size and get to know why do you want to use a margin. And you kind of don't read anything before 2018. <laughs> <laughs> don't read anything about how to use Flexbox that comes from 2014, 2016, just don't. Um, if the code works, you're doing it right. <laughs> if you accomplished the layout that you wanted, then you did it. Yay, good job. There's nothing wrong with your code, right? Like <laughs> it's that, in a way it's that easy. Like it's that, and maybe you invented something new that no one else has done. Cool, write a blog post about it and you can show other people what you did. Um, we're sort of free from good and bad, right and wrong, hacky and not hacky. And if you're using semantic HTML that's accessible and you're using CSS for layout, 
and it works, especially if it works, you test in multiple browsers, multiple devices, multiple size screens, and it works, then you're good. You did it. Congratulations. So we don't need importance anymore? <laughs> well, that's actually, that's a whole other thing that we're looking at um, uh, is like the cascade and how to uh, cascade and, and get people to stop using it. So the, but the, the, the second question in that question was, how, what's the best way to kind of organize your code or how to, you know, yeah, they're looking for something. It sounds like they're looking for a good example of a project structure and, and CSS right. code to like reference. Right, because there's all this like, you should use BEM. No, Smacks is BEM. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. Atomic CSS, no. I mean, there are lots and lots of third-party ideas, third-person ideas. Um, I think really that's a human question. And if I were joining your team and I was the tech lead and I was day one and, I, and somebody and they and you hired me to come in and like fix it for whatever reason, I'd be like, well, who are the humans? How many humans do you have? How many, how fast do they come and go? Are there lots of freelancers that join and leave quickly? Well, then maybe you should stick to a method that lots of teams use because then they can on ramp faster and get off faster. Oh, no, you don't have a lot of turnover. You're a company with a, a, a stable team. Well, then maybe we should build a custom system that is oh we have a crazy weird back end that's impossible to change well then let's design our system to handle that with the least amount of pain or oh we're, re we're starting everything from scratch or so i think it just depends it depends it depends it depends and there's lots of good ideas out there about design systems but i don't think it's that that's the right solution for every project um i, th I think there's principles that are true for all of programming that are good ones and they're the ones that the lighter you get in the career the more viscerally you feel the pain of not valuing these things I'm about to list and you learn the hard way like why they're valuable and those are the things that I would bring to a team in answering this question like how should we structure our CSS don't over engineer it <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> don't build something for 75 people when you have seven people like don't reach for a massive framework when you don't actually know why what use cases it solves or what problems it solves and you don't actually have those problems like don't use something because you think it's cool or hot or somebody who looks like a good dude you'd like to hang out with told you on twitter it's the best one like like take some time to be like what are the they're all solutions that. to a problem like what what's the problem do you have the same problem then maybe that's a good solution do you have a totally different problem then maybe that's probably not a good solution and that's that's a bad answer because it's not easy it's like well go do your homework and do all your research and make your own decision <laughs> like, <laughs> instead it's of being like it. bootstrap is the best thing always use bootstrap God. or bootstrap is the worst thing ever never use bootstrap like it's it's appealing, those kind of quick answers are appealing. But if you, like I said, if you hired me to come in, I would not give you a quick answer. Like it's a, yeah. it's about humans. It's about, it's not that one tool is better. It's that one set of tools is the right appropriate to fit for your team and your company, your project, your set of projects, your site, your set of sites, your app, your set of apps. And I don't know what that is. So. We kind of have a, a I don't I want to I don't want to say a follow up, but it kind of goes along with what we just asked. Another uh, question from someone in the audience here, um, and they wrote, "Hey, we are in 2020. Should we still worry about the compatibility with old browsers with Grid? Uh, the fact Ooh. is that seven percent of our traffic user uses an old version of IE, and it is probably a decision." of us, but uh, and for, I'm, uh, for I'm us. this verbatim, yeah. but yeah, and he probably meant for us, but I would like to know your opinion. So he's citing that, you know, we're in 2020, yeah. do, we're using grid, 77% uh, 7 of traffic's using old browsers like IE, uh, yeah. what do you think? So here's my answer. Despite the fact that teams think they get to choose whether or not they're supporting Internet Explorer or any other older browser or any other edge case browser, browsers that they may not be thinking about like QQ browser or UC browser. Um, it doesn't matter what the team decides, there will be users using those browsers on your website. Like you don't get to decide whether or not they show up, they're gonna show up. The question really, and it's a good question into the budgetary question is, are you gonna QA those browsers? Is your QA team gonna use IE 11 and test and give you bugs? Or are you gonna kind of ignore the bugs and not test? 
Um, and that's a hard question. It depends on how big your QA team is, is and your budget is and your quality assurance is what QA stands for, for anybody who doesn't, hasn't heard of that. And that's typically when there's a bigger project, there's like a separate team that tests the project before it ships in order to see whether or not. And that team, there's a sort of frequently, or if you're a development shop and you get hired to come in and build a website for a client, that client is gonna, you probably are gonna have a conversation about what browsers are we gonna support? And really that's a conversation of, what do we wanna take the time to test and bug fix for? Because you don't have unlimited resources. You can't test every single browser that ever existed. You're not gonna test a Netscape 4. Like, there's a limit. So where, where do you want to draw the limit? And it's a good idea to talk about that. Um, and again, I think it, I would say it depends, you know, if we were working on some massive website, like that got a, a tremendous amount of traffic, especially a website that might be very, you know, we're building a website about health information and COVID and how to get help to find out whether or not you're, you have symptoms. Like that should work in every website, every browser, every phone. We should test, we should, you know, that's, that's people's lives. If we're like building a small site uh, that's a tech blog about the newest, hottest, latest CSS grid features and what's going on in tech news, like maybe we don't test it in IE 11. We don't, you know, we just, it's three volunteers doing this as a side project on Saturday. Like we're not gonna have time to test in IE 11. Um, but the other thing is, um, all of CSS, and this is true of CSS Grid as well, is you can structure your CSS and as you write it, and other code too, this is true of JavaScript, it's true of HTML, it's true of every bit of the web stack. If you understand how failure happens, then even without testing, you can plan for failure and you can write code that's resilient. And it's one of the most beautiful things about CSS is that I can write a bunch of code and I can make assumptions about what's going to happen in IE. I can maybe go to caniuse.com real quick a couple times and look up something to double check because I can't remember whether Flex Gap is in Chrome 75 or not. Oh, it's not. Wait, is it, which one is it? You know, like I can, and then I can sort of structure my code in such a way so that it does this if a browser supports Flex Gap and it does this if it doesn't, or it does this if it, actually that's one bad example, but it, if it supports subgrid, then it does this. If it doesn't support subgrid, it does that. Or if it supports grid in general, it does this. Or if it doesn't support grid, it does that. Or, you know, it's weird that IE 10 and 11 do support the MS prefixed version of grid, yeah. which is a very different creature than the real grid that came out five years later, because it was the experimental implementation that Microsoft led the industry with back in 2011, which was amazing. But once Grid got finished and shipped in 2017, it was a very different creature. But some teams, it would make sense to use that MS prefixed, leverage that power, write some code that will work in IE 11, IE 10 using the old grid, you just have to think about it and structure it. So for folks who may not have thought about it that way, I actually have a seven part series on the Layout Land YouTube channel where I show you exactly how to do this. Exactly when can you use something that's newer like subgrid or masonry layout eventually when it starts shipping and still support the browsers that don't quite have it yet because it's there's always gonna be something, there's always going to be something. There's some browser that hasn't quite shipped a thing yet. Um, and I'm a big fan of using the newer technology soon. Like use Subgrid today, use Subgrid now. It's only in Firefox. Oh, that's not a lot of browsers. Okay, so yes, you have to support what happens when you don't have Subgrid. And if you just sort of think about it and you think through the code and you're, you're like, oh, so if it has Subgrid, things will line up really nicely. And if it doesn't have Subgrid, it'll be a little bit out of line all right, that's fine. I can live with that. Um, and then that there are other uh, things that you can't, there are other things that aren't supported and you're like, oh, I can't use this because it's not supported. So, okay, I'll wait on that one. So those, those seven videos will help you understand when is it that you can use it? When is it that you can't use it? How do you use it? How do you use a feature query? How do you use progressive enhancement? How do you use fallbacks? How do you use the cascade in order to make sure that your code is going to work in all browsers and you, and without even necessarily testing it, like Making a decision to test is one decision to make, but you could still write good code. Even I write code for IE all the time and I never open IE. Is that the resilient CSS series? Yes. Just, just so our listeners. Okay. And that'll yeah. that will link that in our show notes for our listeners. There's a playlist uh, called Res that says resilient CSS on it. Um, or they're also numbered, so you can try to watch them, you know, watch them in order. But they're also in they're in seven separate parts, so you can like 
rewatch one part or send it to your colleague at work or You know, talking about masonry, um, do you mind explaining what that is? Since I, I've seen you bring it up on uh, on Twitter a little bit, and, yeah. Uh, wh why that? Why it's important? And since uh, it's so new, masons. nobody knows what it is. So I should explain. Yeah. It. Um. So we have now a world where we can do different layouts using multi-column, using grid, using flexbox, using the 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 flow layout, the default block flow layout. And, but you can't do everything with those tools. And one of the layouts that a lot of teams still want to be able to do is a layout that gets sometimes called masonry layout. Um, and you've probably, as a user, have seen it, everybody listening, if you've gone to say Pinterest or other websites where the way that those folks, those, the most commonly used way to do it is where there's multiple columns, all the columns are the same width as each other. So let's say they're all, there's four columns and they're each sort of 25% ish of the total space. But then the height of the content is different heights. If you have a whole bunch of photos, for example, you don't really know how, if they don't all have the same aspect ratio, some of the photos are gonna be kind of a square and some are gonna be really tall and some might be kind of short and wider than they are tall. Um, and so a masonry layout kind of tucks everything up against each other like bricks or like stones in a wall. Um, that's the name masonry. And the only way to accomplish that right now is to use JavaScript to do it. Pinterest uses JavaScript to do it. Um, and there's a library called masonry.js that's very popular that you can search for and find um, that you can throw at your website and get yourself a masonry layout. So one of the questions that people asked when Grid first shipped and they were like so excited and then they'd be like, how do you do a masonry layout in CSS Grid? I want to do it. Let's go. And it's like mm, you can't. It doesn't do that. That's not what it does. <laughs> so um, one of the things that the team I've been on, the uh, at Mozilla on Firefox, uh, there's um, one of the teams that I work with is the platform layout team, the team that implements all of the CSS properties and is very concerned about layout and making sure that layout is working and it's really, really fast. A couple of years ago, they made it all much faster and everything. And they implemented, Max Pelgrim um, implemented CSS Grid and Daniel Holbrook implemented Flexbox and other folks on the team have implemented variable fonts and all of the cool new things. And so Matt was like, he decided he just really, I mean, we, we always discuss what other things need to be going on. There's lots of ideas about things that need to get, need to get added to grid. Um, so like uh, other people in the CSS working group, when gaps came along, like we implemented that, that team, our team at Mozilla implemented um, gaps for Flexbox before any other team, right? Like this team in the last several years has really had a commitment to innovation and the future and helping push things along slowly because it takes time, but getting new things into CSS. And so the, the most recent thing, oh, we did the images, the image loading aspect ratio stuff, which we can talk about too. Um, there's the aspect ratio property coming in, there's aspect ratio change, a change to how image loading happens. That's, that, that work was all led by, by myself and this team at Mozilla. Um, uh, so Matt's, in, Matt's decided over the winter that he really wanted to try to figure out masonry. How could the web have masonry in CSS? instead of having to use JavaScript for layout. Why is using JavaScript for layout bad? Because it's slow, because it, it's not the first paint. You wanna get it like immediately, first paint, boom, right there. And JavaScript takes a couple extra rounds. And even though some of it is super, you know, the Pinterest team has optimized it like crazy. So it doesn't necessarily seem slow. Like it, it's not a good idea to use JavaScript for layout. It's better to have it in CSS natively, so. Um, and his experimental implementation, it's an experiment. It's in Nightly right now, Firefox Nightly. And you have to go in, you have to go to about colon config and you have to type about colon config in the URL bar and then open up this sort of secret section of the browser and search for the word masonry and turn it on. And then I made some demos. I have, we'll, we'll link them in the notes. I've got three different demos of masonry. Um, the first one kind of compares it to Grid and Flexbox, so you're like, but isn't it, can't Grid do this? I thought you could do this with Flexbox. I thought you could do this with multi-column. It should have, like you click a button and it just sort of like switches. It, it shows you the comparison between the two layouts or the, you know, the four layouts. Um, 
And then there's some others that are like, hey, not only can you have the columns all be the same width, which is what everybody's been doing with the JavaScript stuff, but if we, if, if the CSS working group decides, and this is not decided, but if the CSS working group decides to add this masonry keyword to grid and make it part of grid, then in the, if, if the typical way it would be the columns could be lots of different things. You could use, use grid in the opposite dimension. So you use sort of a masonry packing in one dimension. And then in the other dimension, you could use grid. You could use the full power of grid. So you could have columns that are all sorts of different widths from each other that are a golden ratio array or that a few of them are like, there's not sidebar of ads. It's always fixed width and it never goes away. And then the other number of columns comes and goes and is morphed depending on the amount of space available on the screen. These are things you couldn't do in the original responsive web design. You couldn't have a fixed width column and flexible columns at the same time. You can totally do that very easily now with grid. Um, and so putting making masonry part of grid would mean that you get all the power of grid in one dimension while you get the masonry packet in the other dimension. But it is an experiment. It's not been spec'd. It's not been agreed on in the CSS working group yet. It's a conversation that's being had. The implementation is not an intention to hurry up and ship it and be like, woohoo, we're done, because that would be very rude. That would be not, that would be subverting the process. We need to have a conversation about it. Um, the implementation, though, is a way to have running code so that we have a prototype so that we can see whether or not it's a good idea. And maybe, maybe. The, the folks who make these decisions, which are people from Safari and Chrome and Edge and other browser makers from Apple, from Samsung, from LG, from um, the Washington Post just joined the CSS working group. Um, folks get to decide like, oh, maybe we don't want it to be part of masonry. Maybe it should be display masonry and be, I mean, we don't want it to be part of grid. Maybe it should be display the masonry and be a completely separate mm. thing. Um, that was a big debate when we first started discussing this theoretically in December. Mm. Now we have an implementation so we can actually just, sometimes, you know, it's probably also true with design, web design. Like sometimes it's better to just, or app design, sometimes it's better just to have a prototype than to have static drawings and a bunch of talking. <laughs> so that's what this is, the prototype. Um, and if it turns out that this is how we, the CSS working group decides to, and the coalition of folks who make websites or web browsers decide to do it, then yeah, then, then maybe a lot of things won't need to change from the prototype and it will just get shipped, but maybe it will get completely overhauled and rewritten, who knows. But that's what that's that's a very long answer to what is masonry? What's going on with that? Oh, no, that's great, thanks. Awesome though. Yeah, that was great. So I have another question on the live chat. Looks like we have time. Um, this one's from Amir. Uh, in a recent project that I did, I wrote about 15 direct break, break point per module because it was my first official project and I wanted it to be pixel perfect. Mm -hmm. So he's asking, is that a bad idea? Is writing more CSS for having a pixel perfect project a bad thing? Mm -hmm. So 15 breakpoints, I don't, I don't have a problem with that. I think it gets a little bit back to the, how do you want to or organize your code question? Yeah. And you know, if, if the code, any code gets turns into spaghetti and gets sort of out of control and nobody really knows what's going on, that's a problem, especially on a big team, especially over a long time. But there are also times when uh, plenty of my projects have 15 breakpoints. I don't even call them breakpoints. I'm just like, I just, I wanna make an adjustment at some point. I figure out where that adjustment should be. Some, some folks are really into being like, you define your breakpoints, you have five of them and they're like, and you never use any other number. You just always use those five, you put them in variables. They're like the official <laughs> ones, they're in the design system. I, I personally, I don't ever yeah. work that way. I also, I haven't worked as a front end developer in quite a while, right? I've been, I've had this other job, so. Um, but when it comes to this idea of pixel perfect, aha, I have a lot to say about that. I'll try to answer more briefly, but uh, no, there's no such thing as pixel perfect. There's literally no such thing. Um, that is a holdover concept from back in the day when computers were 640 by 480 and there were 216 colors and we used Dreamweaver and fireworks and Photoshop to draw pictures of websites, to talk about what we wanted them to look like, to then later give them to people who would build that website. Especially since a lot of those websites were, you would just take the Photoshop document and cut it up into puzzle pieces and take those puzzle pieces and shove them into table cells, right? Like 
you kind of needed to draw a picture uh, of the website so you could chop I the website that. up and then you could put the website back together again in HTML tables. Those, those rounded corner GIFs. Oh, right. I, I hated those days. <laughs> because, because you couldn't do rounded corners, you couldn't do drop shadows, you couldn't do any fonts except for like a Helvetica Avenir and Times New Roman or, or, or Georgia, right? So if you wanted to use other Comic fonts. Sans. Comic Sans. <laughs> Like, so we were used to drawing all the graphics and then putting all the graphics on the web page as images, right? We don't do any of that anymore. You use web fonts, you use drop shadows, you use gradients, you use, right? So it's funny that we got to this place where those habits became so ingrained that sometimes, many times, many, many times, you know, you go to art school, you spend a lot of money, you get a big degree, you come out, you've got this fancy, fancy BFA and web graphic design and digital fanciness. And then you find out that the entire way that you were taught to work, which is think about static comps, think about pixel perfect, make PDFs, email the PDF to your technology developer, engineering people, and then just demand that you have pixel perfect. And I said that should be eight pixels and it's nine, it's broken, right? But that's not how the web works. It's just not how the web works at all. Um, if you take a, an amazing, gorgeous web font and you put it on a website and you open it in 14 different browsers on seven, you know, five different operating systems on nine different, or you know, nine browsers, five operating systems and 14 different devices and you take screenshots, you're gonna get very, something very different every time. The color orange is gonna be slightly different. Some of them are retina screen, some of them are three X, some of them are one X. The font is a little bit bolder in this browser than that browser. Mm -hmm. It's the, the, like the shape of the E is a little different in this operating system from that operating system. Like this phone is a little bit wider than that other phone, even though they're manufactured by the same company and are running the same software. Like it, you can't control any of those things and you shouldn't try. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the beauty of the web. The beauty of the web is that you don't need to, you don't need to, you don't have to worry about any of that stuff. So. And the thing about CSS Grid and the reason, the thing that I'm sort of disappointed on, because I want all those art school students with the amazing graphic design theory-based, historical-based training to catapult us into a world of digital 21st century graphic design where we take these ideas from the past and we apply them to the reality that we're in where with CSS Grid, you can do the most amazing things. You're programming a layout. It's not just, I want these columns to be this ratio to each other at these static moments. It's, okay, I got this image and I want this image to morph and grow. And when it's bigger than this, I want this to shrink to make more space. But when it's smaller on, the, on you know, when the newspaper article, when the original, when the person who put the image up, put up an image that's landscape, I want the layout to be like this. And when they put the image up that's portrait, I want the land, the, the the layout to be like this. And we just programmed one template, but it morphs and changes depending on the content that's inside the template. Or, oh, when the headline starts wrapping, I want this to move down and I want these things over here to line up with that. And you're programming robots to do a graphic design layout for you. You're not doing the layout. You're not laying, if you work at the Washington Post, you're not laying out every single solitary article in InDesign and taking a screenshot and mailing it to a developer who's writing code for that one article. Sometimes that happens when it's an experiment or they're pushing the, the envelope for the future, but that doesn't happen on every single solitary article every day. That article template needs to be programmed so that there's all this, it maybe looks different to the users all the time, but it's actually one set of code and it's responding and morphing and, that's what I think, that's where the exciting part is as a, as a graphic designer is to, is if people would really understand that, let go of the pixel perfect and pick up the flexibility or what I was calling intrinsic web design in order to try to explain it and try to, that's what all the conference talks over the last five years, if people want to watch them, I get into the details of this to try to explain like how these columns, for instance, there's creatures, they're like moving creatures. How do they react and respond to each other? How do they affect each other? Um, and anyway, it's hard to explain in a, without diagrams and examples, but. Yeah. I think you did a great job. <laughs> Agreed. Jen, we're, we're getting close to the end and I'd feel bad if we didn't get to talk about your, um, your new 
uh, tutorial here, the, uh, the the training, the new HTML essential training. Um, I'd love to know what brought that on, why why this subject, and uh, uh, how it's doing. Yeah. So if you go to Linda, Linda.com, oh, not um, LinkedIn, LinkedIn Learning is what it's called. It actually it, it used to be Linda.com, but now it's yeah. LinkedIn Learning. You go to LinkedIn Learning, um, which a lot of people have for free and maybe don't even know it. Uh, some places like some public libraries in the United States or some colleges or universities, like they get these big licenses where everybody in Brooklyn actually has access to LinkedIn Learning or everybody at this university has access to LinkedIn Learning or everybody at your company might have access to LinkedIn Learning for free. So you may have access for free. You just got to poke around and see. Um, or of course you can go subscribe. Um, I, maybe I'm supposed to say that, go subscribe. Uh, but it's a course on LinkedIn Learning called HTML Essentials. So it's been a long running course. They've had it for many years. Um, really the point of it is, hey, you're a Java engineer with a PhD in computer science and now you're like stuck on the web team and you're not really sure what you're supposed to know about HTML or you're a content person. You, you know, you were an English major in college and you don't really understand all this programming stuff. You don't know how websites get built, but you're the person adding content to the WordPress temp to system and you, and you're, and you're supposed to be able to click on the HTML button and like edit the HTML and you're trying to understand HTML better. Like it's, it's a course that's designed for all of those people, no matter how much computer science background you might or might not have. Um, to really get at the essentials of what do you need to know about HTML? What's important? Let's not talk about the stuff that doesn't matter. Let's not talk about the old stuff. Let's just talk about today. What do you need to know? How do you do images? How do you do responsive images? How do you do accessible code? When do, when, what are you supposed to use definition lists for? Uh, is it okay to use a div in this situation? When should you use section? When are you supposed to use H1 or H3 or H7, H6? Um, uh, yeah, it's, so the idea is to kind of boil down what everyone, everyone, really, anyone who uses HTML should know about HTML. Um, and in fact, I think they're about to, or maybe they have already, but maybe they're about to um, put that course into a group of courses and make it free for everybody to take that group of courses. It's sort of essential, a bunch of stuff. Um, I think in the age of COVID right now, because so many people are taking time to learn more. Um, so it might actually be free for you right now, but, uh, it was fun to do. I spent, oh my gosh, I spent a really long time, like a really long time writing, doing all the research and writing all the scripts for that. And I went out to California and stood in front of a, in a television studio with a teleprompter, which I had never done before. And a crew. How many takes? How many takes scary. per? Uh, I don't know. Some of them, they're actually, you know, like Monday we did a bunch and then by Thursday they were like, okay, let's re-record everything that you did on Monday. Oh, <laughs> <I was> no. like, <laughs> because it's so hard to be, I'm really, I can be supernatural when I'm improvising, but to be supernatural and teleprompter was like a whole other skill set. Yeah. I, um, I was going home and studying like, not home, but going back to the hotel and being like, how does Stephen Colbert pull this off? Like, <sighs> What does Trevor Noah do? <laughs> what can I learn from Samantha B about teleprompters? Like, <laughs> I, I learned a lot and I got much better at it. Um, but still, sometimes I look and I'm like, oh, I look so awkward. I look like I'm just reading a script. But who cares Everyone, about that? Everybody uh, has that. Uh, yeah. Well, I'm curious, like where was the, tele did you have like a screen in front of you and then like a teleprompter below it or above it? Or like, how, how were you working? No, it's very super, you know, professional, real, fancy camera with the teleprompter that's like right in front of the um, camera yeah so you look through the teleprompter at the camera Crazy. And, it, and with an operator moving the text at the speed in which you're going yeah but i think everyone's they're like where do i put my hands i don't and then you're just like <laughs> so let me tell you what I do. <laughs> that's the most natural thing to do <laughs> like, just raise them um, above your head <laughs> behind you. yeah but that was like a year a year and a half of my life or something and it came out in march yeah, it's really nicely done. Uh, we'll, we'll definitely, uh, we've got a show, uh, a link in the show notes for that. And uh, we encourage everybody to take a look. Yeah, I was very um, honored to get a chance to do that because I think that it, it, it has the opportunity to reach a lot of people. And it really is a story of 
how forgiving HTML is and how in some ways it's okay. You don't have to do it right. There kind of isn't a right in certain situations. And you can, yeah. it's up to you if you want to use H2 or H3, like there isn't a hard and fast mm -hmm. rules. And, but then at the same time, like, oh yeah, semantic HTML is this bridge between human meaning, content, words, pictures, it's human communication, even interfaces, buttons, forms, drop downs. Those are, those are ways in which humans communicate with each other that is complicated and rich and nuanced and computers are kind of dumb and not nuanced. They're very binary and mm -hmm. HTML is a bridge in order to do your best it, with, with the amount of time that's available, which isn't much, to communicate some of that richness of humanity to the machines so that the machines know. So the machines know that this is a headline and this is a paragraph and this is a button and this is a link and this is a, because if the machines know those things, it, it, everything just works way better. And sadly, too often, especially when teams use these massive J JavaScript frameworks, which are very popular right now, uh, teams don't leverage that power to to translate human nuance into machine. And so then the machines don't know. And the experience that the machines are able to provide to other humans is not nearly as good because they're just like dip, 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 span. And you're like, but where's the button? Or where's the headline? Or where's the content? Like, oh, it's a span, it's a span, it's a div, it's a div, it's a div, it's a span, it's a div. And you're just like, you're just breaking the system when you do that. So. So that's the story of it. It's like, oh, how do you do, how do you make HTML that's semantic and accessible? Accessibility is key here, but it's not out of some sort of like purity of doing it right because you're not gonna get it perfect because there is no perfect because which word should I use right now as I'm talking to you? Which, what, what is the correct word to use? How am I supposed to use uh, my voice to, there is no correct word, it's, it's art, it's humanity, it's messy. I can use whatever words I want. There is no, oh, but then there is human grammar and I am speaking English and, you know, so it's that kind of a, it, it's this weird intersection. I think sometimes mm. part of the reason programmers get so itchy and nervous and upset about it is that, is that you do want just like, which API am I supposed to use? I, I like APIs, tell me which API to use. It's like, well, it, it is more like vocabulary words and human nuance and communication. Like there, it depends, it depends on what you want to say. And your fluency is going to depend on how long you've been speaking this language. And it's, it's, it is a programming language. It's a real programming language, but it's not like Java or JavaScript or Swift or Rust or other programming. But it, it's also not, it's not English. It's not Farsi. It's not Mandarin. It's HTML, right? So <laughs> it's code. Um, so anyway, that's my little summary because it's that theme that's underlying the whole thing. How can I empower you to have as much information as possible to make the right decision quickly, but also the freedom to understand that like, there's always, it's, it's, it's an art, you get to choose, it, it depends, you know, it's okay, you're gonna be okay. It's, you're not gonna get accessibility perfect. Like it's, you, there's, there's many, 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 many correct ways to do it. There are many, many, many right ways to do it. So, have, you know, just get some skills and keep going. Love it. Well, Jen, we're uh, at the end of the show and we like to ask two questions. Uh, one, if uh, what's the best way people could find out more about you? Where, where do they go? So I'm on Twitter at Jen Simmons is my username. I am, have a very small website at jensimmons.com, um, which I keep any minute now I will make better. Um, <laughs> I am on uh, uh, everywhere, I guess, like GitHub and all is Jen Simmons. Um, and I have a page of examples of layout stuff at labs.jensimmons.com. I have all of those videos I made uh, several years ago about layout and graphic design at layoutland. You can go to youtube.com slash layoutland um, or layout.land. Dot land is a thing, layout.land. Um, Great URL, by the way. 
Also, all the conference <laughs> talks that are really the best versions of my favorite conference talks from the last five years are in a playlist at layout, the, the youtube.com slash layoutland. There's a playlist of Event Apart. Event Apart does these amazing, these amazing recordings of the talks. So there's yeah. one for, there's five of them, one for each year, um, the last five years. Uh, so those are on the YouTube channel as well. Um, or of course, just, you know, search for my name and find other random stuff that I've done. Excellent. And the, and the last question is if do you have any kind of parting words, final words for our audience today? Wear your masks. <laughs> <coughs> oh, perfect. A little coffee after it. <laughs> take care of each other, you know, take care of each other. Be kind. Yeah. And I feel like, I mean, I, I guess I'm supposed to answer this with a technology thing, but really, I feel like. Oh, no. It doesn't have to be. Like, this whole thing is so stressful, 2020, every single bit of it is so devastatingly upsetting. And I think the best thing that any of us can do is just to really feel it and to slow down and to feel it and let it break you open and figure out how to move forward in your life and figure out what's important and connect with people that you love and take care of each other, even as people are sick, even as people you know are sick, even as people die, even as people you know die, like we can only I hope we're able to really find connection and not what happens when really bad things like this happen is, is and you see it sometimes, I see it on, on, on TV with certain people doing certain things is, is, is the fear and the fear turning into hate and the hate and fear turning into guns and the just like, we, we just need to not do that. Like we can, we can connect with each other as people. Um, and, and remember what's valuable to us and remember what really matters and find ways to help each other and find ways to take care of yourself and be selfish when you need to be selfish. But, but even in those things, like connect to yourself and to, to the people who matter to you and, and don't let the fear turn us into people that we don't really wanna be. Well said, that's great. Yeah, thank you for taking uh, some time with us today. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me. It's the first podcast I've done since all of this went completely nuts. So it's really. Oh, we feel special now. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Jen. Really appreciate it. And thanks, everybody, for watching. Uh, we'll see you later on and uh, take care. Thanks.